Hey, whatever part of the world you're joining us from, whatever time it is, wherever you are, allow me to welcome you to Mavuno Church Online and welcome to the home of the fearless. It's such a joy to have you with us today. You know, one of the verses that's been so instrumental for me all through this year is Isaiah 30, 18. And it says this, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and He will rise up to show you compassion. You know what I get? What the sensing I get is that today God wants to be gracious to someone. He wants to rise up today and show you compassion. And what He asks of you today is that you would still your heart and that you have a posture of, Lord, I want to hear what it is that you have to say to me today. So if this, if today you're, you know, making a cup of tea or you've turned this thing on and it's in the background somewhere, let me encourage you. Grab a seat, be in the front row, and still your heart long enough to hear from the Lord today. Today we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord in music. We're going to worship Him with our gifts and the things that He blesses us with. But we're also going to listen out for God's Word. And I pray for you today that you would hear God's Word and that it would resonate with your heart, with your mind, and with your spirit today. Allow me to pray for us as we get started. Dear Father, as we come before you today, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the gift that you give us as your people to come together all around the world and to be able to engage with you and to engage with your word. I pray today, still our hearts, allow us to hear you, remove every distraction from our lives and allow us to worship you and lift up your holy name. In Jesus' name. Lord, our desire is to know you and to know you deeply. This is our prayer. It's in knowing you that we discover who we truly are. So Lord, we want to fix our eyes on you today. We want to know you more. We want to see you. We want to hear you. We want to follow your lead. So Heavenly Father, hear our prayer as your people today. It goes like this. I want to know you. 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 I want to see you, I want to see you, to see your holy face. I want to see you, want to see you, I want to see you. I want to hear you, I want to hear you, I want to hear your voice. Follow your lead, oh Lord. I want to hear you. Your name, your name, your name. It saves, it saves, it saves.
want to know you I want to know you I want to know you I want to know you Lord Holy Spirit help us get over ourselves as we fix our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that Lord, you'd give us right perspective. Because God, we remember that when you take your rightful place, all other things take their rightful place. So Lord, as we draw closer to you, as you draw us deeper to who you are, show us who we were meant to be. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Welcome to church. My name is Moredi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church, also known as Pastor M. And it is such a joy to be able to worship with you today. Uh, wherever in the world you're watching from, we're so, so glad you're here. Uh, please, if you're able to just uh, use the link on the screen, go on our website, tell us where you're watching from. Uh, Mavuno at home, if you're watching this from your home, your office, tell us who you're watching it with. We love to know this so that we can be in prayer for you. And one of the things that we're so excited as we're jumping into this new month, we have a whole brand new series. Uh, it's going to be led by one of my favorite preachers. Uh, he's a pastor at Mavuno Church, leads Mavuno Church, Lovington. Uh, his name is Pastor David Courier. Oh my goodness, I know we're in for a treat. And I really believe that God wants us to grow in our leadership capacity. And I believe that this series is going to stretch our leadership capacity. So hey, if you've got a friend who needs to watch this, share the link with them, get them to watch with you, invite them this month to watch with you at home. Uh, and let's, let's just share the love. Let's, get, let's see how God can grow us as we grow our leadership capacity together. Hey, one of the things that's coming up very soon, uh, right at the beginning of this coming month, July, uh, uh, July 2023 is something that we call Fearless Summit. It starts on July the, the 6th and goes all the way to the 8th. And it's going to be a phenomenal time. I'm really excited about Fearless because this is a time when we come together as all the, the marketplace leaders and church leaders and we sort of grapple with this thing about what does it mean for me to, ex uh, to, to exercise my purpose in the place that God has called me. I believe that God has a very powerful message this year for all of us as leaders in the church, as leaders in the marketplace, wherever God has put us. So I want to invite you to just uh, sign up. There's actually an offer going on right now. It, it ends June the 7th it's, it's ending very soon and so this could be your last opportunity to do that you can see the stuff on the screen uh, please sign up would love to have as many of you and even if you're watching from another country we're going to have a stream if you want to sign up for that as well uh, use the same sign ups tell us where you're watching from and we want to make sure that as many of us are growing together set out those dates mark them on your calendar uh, blank them out take time off work because I believe this is going to be every bit worth your while. So as we prepare for the message, we also want to uh, worship God with our tithes and our offerings. And I am so in love with the, the incredible generous givers of this church. Uh, this is a church that has been run over the years uh, simply because of the generosity of God's people who understand their mandate. They understand that everything they have belongs to God and that whenever they are giving towards His work, they're simply just becoming partners uh, with the one, the, the king, the one who owns everything. Uh, and in gratitude saying, God, it all belongs to you. I want to give it back towards your work. And so you can use the information on the screen if you'd like to give. Uh, for those of you who are giving for the first time, many of you already have been giving uh, over the years. And we want, just want to encourage you to, to keep being faithful because I, I know that God is faithful. And you know, as whenever we give, the one thing I've come to understand is you can never outgive God. Uh, that God is faithful, and whenever we identify with Him in our giving, whenever we, we give, what we're saying is, God, everything belongs to you. Uh, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And whenever we give, what are we saying? We're saying, God, it all belongs to you. I want to extend it towards your work, and I want to trust you to continue to being the one who pro to provide for me and my family. And so uh, I want to just pray for us. 
as we give and also uh, as we prepare to receive God's word this morning. Are you ready? Let's do this. My Father, I want to thank you for the amazing congregation that you've called Mavuno. This family that spreads out across the world in different time zones. Uh, men and women and children, uh, people uh, of different races, uh, but bound by one thing. We're bound by the blood of Jesus who makes us one. And I thank you, Lord, for every one of us, regardless of where we're coming from, that we trust in you. I pray that, Lord, even as we give today towards your work, Lord, show yourself strong. Uh, for those of you who are, for those of who are here who are trusting God for, for an intervention, not just in their finances, but in their family in different things. I pray that, Lord, you'd show yourself strong. And I pray that, Lord, you would bless us in every way so that we can continue to be generous as you call us to be. Father, I also want to pray for us as we receive your word. I really sense that there's a word you have for us this month that's going to expand our leadership capacity. And I pray that, Lord, you'd you'd make us ready. Uh, Open our hearts now. Open our eyes. Get us ready for the amazing time that is ahead of us. And I pray that, Lord, while on others you're calling, you will not pass us by. Give us a word, every one of us. Open our eyes so that we're able to understand ourselves and also to understand the people around us. And so God's people, I bless you now as you prepare to hear God's word. May God reveal himself to you today. While on others, he is calling. He will not pass you by. I pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, welcome once again to Mavuno Church Online and the home of the fearless. It's so good to have you wherever you are, whatever time it is. So great to have you joining us today. And it's an exciting time because we are starting a brand new series today. And that series is called Box of Chocolates. But before we get into that, I've got a question for you as we start. Now, I know, I know you guys are Mavunites. I know that you are very spiritual, very religious people. You only watch the Jesus film. But if I asked you, what's one of your favorite movie lines? Is there any line from a movie that kind of sticks in your head and just stays there? I asked some of my friends this week and they gave me some really, really cool lines. Obviously, there is the Hasta la Vista, baby. That was one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's, you know. Another one was I'll Be Back from The Terminator. Uh, Jerry Maguire had the show me the money, uh, you know, line from that movie. Uh, Every Bond movie obviously has that, you know, line, Bond, James Bond. And there are all these, these you know, different ones. Oh, Apollo 13 had um, Houston, we have a problem. But when I think about uh, an iconic movie line. I think about an old movie. It's a 1994 movie, but it's a classic. It's called Forrest Gump. And in this movie, the main character, played by one of my favorite actors, Tom Hanks, says this line. He says, my mama always told me, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And it's not true. That's exactly how a box of chocolates is. I have one here with me, a box of chocolates. You know, you open your box of chocolates and it has all sorts of, you know, colors and shapes and sizes and flavors and flavor profiles. This is very much how life is because we as humans are very much like this box of chocolates. We are in many ways, you know, different shapes, different sizes. We, we come in such uniqueness and such diversity in many different ways. And one of the ways that we are very different is in the way of our personality and the way of our character. You know, some people are extroverted and loud. Some people are quiet and they're shy. Some people are cool, calm and collected. Others are hot-headed and boisterous. Some are analytical and perfectionists. Some are creative. We are all different shapes and sizes. And God, the master creator, made all of us like that for a very, very specific reason. Now, one of the good things that God designed us with is our personality. And what's personality? It really is the unique combination that every single one of us has of our character, uh, you know, our traits, uh, our behavior, our emotional pattern. When you put all of those together, what they form is really our personality. You know, personality is what determines is someone extroverted or are they introverted? Are they, you know, diplomatic with the way that they speak or are they straight and direct? And you know, for Hundreds of years, 
behavioral scientists have been studying personality, trying to get a sense, trying to help, un- help us understand what makes humans tick. Why are we the way that we are? And you know, behavioral scientists have come up with many different theories through the years, different ways of trying to analyze humanity and our personality to understand how we work. If you were to go online today, you'll find a ton of personality tests. You know, you'll find the Myers-Briggs, the the Kersey Temperament Sorter, the Strength Deployment Inventory. All of these are available online. But for the next month, we want to look at one of these personality theories and see how it interplays with the faith that you and I share. This is one that's tried and tested, stood the test of time, and it's called the Temperament Theory. Now, the Temperament Theory really suggests this that humans in terms of personality can be grouped into one of four general areas. You can be a sanguine, you can be a choleric, you can be melancholy, or you can be a phlegmatic. And that's one that people have used for many, many years. Now, just to say, the goal of this theories, even this one that we're going to use throughout this month, is not to box anyone or pigeonhole anyone. It's just a potential framework for understanding personality and behavior. The goal of it is really to be able to get some insights so that we are able to understand how has God made me in terms of my strengths, but what are some of the weaknesses that the enemy can take take advantage of? Do I have maybe some blind spots that I need to be aware of in my leadership and in my life? And that's really the goal of this thing. I mean, I know there are many different ones that we, you know, could have done and chosen, but we are going with the temperament theory for the, for the you know, benefit of this month and for increasing our self-awareness. Proverbs chapter 4 has a verse I really like. It says this, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget to turn away from, sorry, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. You know, church, what I feel? The Lord today is inviting us to a place of sober understanding about ourselves and a place of increased self awareness so that we can know who we are, how God has created each one of us and that we can take advantage of that. Hey, if you've not done the temperament theory or it's been a while since you've done that, hey, let me encourage you. Why not go over to our website, www.mavunochurch.org and you can find the test there. Do it and see what this thing says about you. And through the month, we'll try and figure out how that connects to our faith. So, hey, Welcome to Box of Chocolates, our series throughout the month that will help us understand our unique leadership flavor. Now, today, we grab our box of chocolates and we open it and we find that there are all kinds of shapes and colors and sizes. I discovered something this week that I didn't know. I discovered that whenever you find a piece of chocolate in a box that has a square shape or that is rectangular, generally what it has inside is caramel or toffee. Try it. Open a box of chocolates and see. Rectangular square has uh, toffee or chocolates inside of it. And the thing about toffee and the thing about caramel especially is that it's very buttery. It's smooth. It's buttery. It's got rich, delicious flavor. And you know, I thought to myself, if we're talking temperaments and we're talking about the caramel temperament, which is the one that's sweet and buttery? Only one came to mind, the sanguine. And today we're going to focus on that or what for the benefit of today I may call your caramel flavored sanguine. Now, in just a moment, we're going to dig into God's word and see what we can learn from a Bible character who in many ways was the quintessential sanguine. I'm telling you, when you come across this character, he's just, he's incredible. And we're going to talk about him in just a moment. But for the benefit of those who may not know, who's a sanguine? What do we know about sanguines? Sanguines, let me tell you, are joyous people. If you've been around one, the people who are full of joy, they eat life with a big spoon. They're cheerful, they're fun-loving. Hey, if you're ever in need of a plan, look for a sanguine. A sanguine will come up with a plan for you for sure because they love life and they love to live it. They're optimistic and they're enthusiastic and they've got a great can-do attitude, which means if you're in the workplace, man, you want a sanguine on your team because they just bring energy, they bring optimism, they bring enthusiasm to what's going on. 
They're creative. They are colorful. They're always thinking up new and exciting ideas. If you're doing a brainstorming session, you want a sanguine in the room for sure. They've got great people skills and they love an audience. Man, you give a sanguine an audience and they are ready to perform. As a result, they're very popular. People love them. They love to host. They love to entertain. But I love sanguines, man. Sanguines have um, a very childlike simplicity to them. You know, they tend to be sincere, hold very few grudges, and they are very, <laughs> they are very short memories because they live in the present, so they'll forget. They are rarely depressed by the failures or the issues of the past. They want to live in the moment. Do you know a sanguine? Do you know someone who has the sanguine flavor in their life? Let me tell you, clearly, the world needs sanguines. We do. We need the joy and the life that they bring because they make life sweet. They bring that caramel flavor into this box of chocolates. But let me tell you, caramel is fantastic, but it also has its downside because it's predominantly made of sugar. And you know what it's like when you've got too much sugar in your body. So there's a downside. So is there a downside? Is there maybe some blind spot, you know, where sang the sanguine flavor is concerned? There definitely is. You see, because of their love for the stage, and their love for attention. Sanguines can sometimes tend to be self-centered, where they would rather talk than listen. Sanguines can easily dominate conversations, whether they have something useful to add to the conversation or not. So they don't necessarily make the best counselors or, you know, because listening is not really their, their strong suit. But in their bid to be popular, they are great storytellers. But I'm telling you, a sanguine can exaggerate and embellish a story like nobody's business. And one of the, the downside with that is that sometimes it's difficult to take their word and figure out, okay, where does the truth end and where are we beginning to embellish? Other thing about them, so they can forget commitments. Man, if you're meeting a sanguine at two o'clock, oh man, brace yourself. Well, not all sanguines, but you know, it's a, it's, I guess it's a, general, a generality but they forget commitments that they, that they have made. And as a result, they can easily hurt or betray people as a result. They can make fair weather friends because they've got everybody is their friend, everybody. So sometimes they go a little bit shallow with people because they've got so many friends. But if I was to think about one thing that I think a sanguine really, and anybody who has any hinge, any, any little bit of the sanguine personality really must think about, it's discipline. Or maybe a better way to put it, it's in discipline. You see, sanguines, sanguines have great intentions. Great. I mean, their hearts are always in the right place, let me tell you. And they easily commit to tasks. They commit to tasks. They commit to projects. But many times, there's a lack of follow-through, and this ultimately lets them down. And this in discipline, we see it in many different ways. You see it at the workplace. You know, someone who commits to, to starting a project or starting a job or starting a business and they're excited at the beginning, they see the possibilities because they're optimistic and enthusiastic, but there's little follow-through at the end of the day. In relationships, you can see the indiscipline, you know, come through because one of the disciplines they don't have is that of boundaries. Everybody is their friend. Everybody is in their space. So think about a single guy. A single guy who has strong, sanguine uh, tendencies. He'd be fun-loving, he'd be charming, you know, and he'd attract the opposite sex in droves. But man, as soon as things get, you know, get difficult, or as soon as commitment is required, they can very easily bolt, leaving a trail of broken hearts behind. But even for the married person, you know, if you have no boundaries where relationships are concerned, then it's very easy to begin to become flirty and not even realize and hurt the person that you're with as a result. That line between friendship and flirty gets very, very blurry. But one of the places where that indiscipline shines, <laughs> let me tell you, is where resources and money are concerned. You know, I'm trained predominantly, firstly, as a marketer. That was my first degree. And let me tell you, a sanguine is a marketer's dream because they're impulsive. They're impulsive. The big red sales signs attract them and impulsive buyers follow. Now, let's be real. Is this the case with all sanguines? Is, is this how everyone is? I don't think so. I think that as you grow older, as you mature, as you develop even in your faith and you experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit and you deepen, 
you learn how to accentuate your positives and you learn how to tame your negatives. Man, I've seen many sanguines, and I've got friends, many sanguines who start off and you can see the indiscipline in their lives. But as they begin to settle down and as they begin to get discipline into their, into their worlds, they become incredible leaders. Let me tell you, sanguines make for incredible, incredible leaders. And let's talk now about the quintessential sanguine that we see in the scriptures. His name was Peter, and he was one of the very first disciples of Jesus. So when we first meet Peter, Peter, <laughs> he's loud, he's noticeable, he's impulsive. Everything we see about him, he's the complete extrovert. He's the speak first, think later kind of guy. In fact, in scriptures, as we many times when, when Peter is being described, the words used are instantaneously or, you know, uh, uh, immediately or instantly, straight away. And it captures how Peter lived his life. As a result, he put his foot in his mouth many, many times. Let's talk through some scenarios. So here is Jesus calling his first disciples. And the very first disciples he calls are actually Peter and his brother Andrew. When Jesus says, come follow me, what does Peter do? Peter dumps his nets and he follows, he follows after Jesus immediately. Now, I'm not trying to knock him. It's a great quality because we're supposed to follow after Jesus with all our hearts. Are we not supposed to? But I always wonder, you know, who did he leave the nets with? <laughs> who did he leave the boats with? The fish that he had caught, where was it supposed to go? So it's just questions that are in my head. The other thing about it is when Peter actually follows Jesus, James and John, who are two of his friends and also fishermen, also follow Jesus. And there's a lesson there. Sanguines are influential because people love them and they love following them. And when a sanguine joins something, other people are bound to follow because of how influential they are. But there's more things about Peter that just, they just, they bring a smile to my face. Think about when Jesus and his, Jesus, uh, the disciples of Jesus are on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and they see Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. What does Peter do? He's like, hey, I want to do that as well. He jumps in the water. He's like, Jesus, bid me to come. And he jumps in the water and he quickly realizes, follow through. Oh man, I don't have the faith to get me from here to where, where Jesus is. Later on, you know, uh, Peter, he tells Jesus, oh man, people will deny you. People will leave you. But me, Jesus, me, I will never leave you. You guys know the story. But what happens? That very same evening, he becomes flaky. Not once or twice, but three times he denies Jesus. When Jesus starts to reveal that he's about to be killed, uh, Peter is the one person who rebukes Jesus. You can imagine Peter standing up to the master and saying, never, don't speak like that. It's never going to happen. He's the only one who had the audacity to do that. In the garden of, of Gethsemane, you know, Jesus is about to be uh, arrested. And as people come to Jesus, Peter takes out his sword and he slices this guy's ear off. Man, this guy is impulsive. He's just an incredible, incredible character. Uh, earlier on, you know, the, what they call the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is praying up the mountain and Moses, images of Moses and Elijah appear next to him. And it's so interesting if you read scriptures and go look, look it up for yourself. Peter, it's, it says, and, and Peter answered. I'm like, dude, no one has even asked a question. No one has even asked anything. What are you answering? But Peter, you know, he jumps in and he answers and he says, oh, let's build a tent for Jesus and Moses and a place for them to stay. And it's almost like, oh my goodness, Peter, you say the first thing that comes to your mouth. Jesus is just about to go and be crucified. Why would he want a permanent place to stay? But you know what? As I think about Peter, I think about this character. I love him. He had good intentions. This guy is what we say in Swahili, Roho Safi, he had a pure heart. All his intentions in all the things that he did were good. He was trying to do the right thing. But you know what? His impulsive nature sometimes made him weak-willed, made him indisciplined, and made him a little bit flaky. And what he lacked, to be honest, was the ability to harness his incredible strengths, and sanguines have incredible strengths, but tame his weaknesses. And the one thing I learned about good intentions from Peter, the main point of this sermon is this, is that good intentions are nothing without self-control. Come and say it with me. Good intentions are nothing without self-control. But guys, let me tell you, I'm so glad the story doesn't end there. 
I'm so glad that this story of Peter is so much richer because in the midst of all the issues that Peter has, something incredible is going on in his life. And let's read it together in Matthew chapter 16 from verses 13 to 19. Matthew 16, 13 to 19. This is what it says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, hey, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon. And Simon was Peter's other name, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Guys, listen to what Jesus is saying here. It's so incredible, man. Here is Peter, flaky and unreliable. But what Jesus does in this passage is that Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter. And Peter meant rock, not something that we would easily associate with someone like Peter. But Jesus saw something in him. And he says this, Peter, you are blessed. And upon your confession of the faith, upon your confession, and that thing that you have said, I will build my church. Oh, wow. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? You know, part of the challenge I find as we enter the conversation on personality types, is that it's so easy to pigeonhole people. And next week, we're actually going to spend some time talking about some do's and don'ts when it comes to the personality test and how not to use the personality test. But it's easy for us to say, you know, ah, this person is just like this. They'll always be like this. Their personality is like this. And that's never, ever the intention. It's to learn from it. And Jesus could very easily have pigeonholed Peter. Could have done a test him and said, oh, this guy's a sanguine. I don't think, you know, he's too indisciplined. He, he doesn't have the will, the strength, the commitment to see things through. But I love what Jesus does. Jesus sees beyond his faults and he sees his potential. That's what Jesus does. He sees the God-given potential that this beautiful caramel sanguine has been created with. See what happens. Because after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter and the disciples encounter the Holy Spirit. And Peter moves from being this indisciplined leader to being this incredible, incredible, transformed leader. Here was Peter, someone who was unreliable. He was flaky and impulsive on one hand, but he becomes this incredible, transformed leader. Now we begin to see a leader who's dependable and one who is resolute. You know, he was once a compulsive talker. And see, see what God does. He was once a compulsive talker, but God uses that and transforms it and he turns him into a great speaker. In Acts chapter two, uh, we call it the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples. What happens? Many people are drawn and there's commotion. And Peter is the one now who uses this incredible gift that God has given him. And he stands up and he gives an eloquent speech about what is going on and about what Christ prophesied. Two chapters later in chapter four of, of the book of Acts, he and John are carried off into prison and they're put be, be before this, this um, intimidating religious council known as the Sanhedrin. And what happens? Peter stands up and he gives the most eloquent of speeches. See how God used his gift and transformed him where he loved attention and it was about him. He learned to use that attention, not to tell tall tales and to exaggerate, but to advance a kingdom agenda. Let me tell you, a sanguine with a purpose is a powerful thing. I'll say that again. A sanguine who finds purpose is a powerful thing because all these incredible gifts that the Lord endows them with, now they're able to use them and harness them for leadership. 
In the past, we saw Peter unreliable and unfaithful. He ran at the first sight of trouble. In fact, when Jesus, you know, is crucified, he even goes back to fishing at some point. But again, we see this leader who is resolute, who's dependable. He becomes the rock that Jesus called him out to be. In fact, he becomes the leader and the spokesperson of the disciples. Peter even becomes the, I mean, the leader, but he's also, um, early tradition tells us that Peter actually becomes the bishop of Rome. Wow, this flaky leader, this guy who could not keep his mouth shut. And he led for over 30 years, 30, 35 years. He was known as the bishop of Rome and he accomplished incredible things. He ended up writing some of the books in the Bible. Can you see how God transforms this uncertain, unreliable person? But when he encounters God and he encounters the power of the Holy Spirit, he is transformed into a transformed sanguine. What an incredible testament of God and of what God can do with that sanguine personality. Guys, as I bring this message to a close today, I actually want to close with what I call my ABCs. Here's my A. Acknowledge and celebrate your strengths. Acknowledge and celebrate your strengths. Let me tell you, this world is full of darkness and of pain and of hurt. Oh, how much we need the sanguine. How much we need the joy and the life and the laughter and the optimism and the enthusiasm of the sanguine. Hey, if you have those uh, sanguine tendencies, if you have any of them, let me say to you, celebrate them. That's exactly how the Lord made you. Don't ever let anyone look down on you or make fun of you or say anything negative about you. God made you and you are good. Sanguines, you are special. God has endowed you incredibly to be great leaders. Acknowledge the gifts that you have and say, Lord, how can I use this gift not to advance my agenda, but yours? But B is this, bring your weaknesses to God. You know, what we said earlier is that sanguines are influential. People will follow you because you're popular and wherever you go, they will go. So you've got power, you've got influence. And because of that influence, there's nothing that the enemy would like more than to sabotage you. He would hate for you to discover your kingdom purpose and to begin to live in it. So he begins to sabotage you and he creates blind spots for you. So you're unaware of what your weaknesses are and never accomplish what God intends for you. So sanguine, you must walk with a sense of self-awareness about where your blind spots may be. Let me tell you, if the issue, as we've talked about this today, is follow through or commitment or even discipline, let me encourage you, bring that before the Lord. Say, Lord, you've given me incredible gifts, but there are some weaknesses. And I want to harness, I want to temper these weaknesses so that I can become everything that you have intended for me to be. If maybe you've hurt people or you've betrayed people because you've made commitments and you've never held on to or never kept any of those commitments. Part of this thing of bringing your weaknesses to God is saying, Lord, I want to come and I want to ask for your forgiveness. If maybe in your journey, you haven't been the most committed of friends because you, you don't go deep, you're shallow. Say, Lord, no more. I want to change my ways. In fact, Peter himself in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says this. He says, but grow, listen, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I pray that that would be your goal, to grow in the grace and knowledge. So acknowledge Bring your weaknesses before God. But here's C, commit to walking anew. Hey, once you identify the areas of weakness and the areas maybe where you've lacked discipline or self-control, determine to live differently. Invite the Holy Spirit and just say, Holy Spirit, help me, to, help me to walk the way that you intend for me to walk. Help me to become everything that you intend for me to be. Invite others to help keep you accountable to the journey of faith that you're on so that you can become everything that God intends for you to be. That's a caramel sanguine. You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. God has made you incredible. But just like Jesus told Peter, the enemy wants to sift you like wheat. And Jesus says, but I pray for you that that will never happen. Hey, I pray for you as well. And the enemy will not use your weaknesses against you, but that your strengths will shine 
as I bring this to a close, allow me to pray. And I want to pray for a couple of groups, a couple of different uh, categories. First, I want to pray for you. And I want to celebrate the sanguine flavor, if that's the incredible flavor that the Lord has blessed you with. That, that the Lord would affirm you in your gifting. Hey, but I want to also pray for any sanguine who acknowledges, listen, maybe I've hurt someone or maybe I've betrayed someone because I've not honored my commitments. I haven't kept my word. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a business partner who's disappointed. Maybe it's even a spouse who's disappointed because you haven't honored your word. I wonder if you would come today and say, Lord, forgive me for this. But I also want to pray for anybody who's been hurt or felt betrayed by a sanguine at some point. I pray that even in this space, you would experience the healing of God and the release of God. But also praying for those who would say, Lord, teach me to lead a disciplined life. Fathers, we come in your presence today. I want to thank you for everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice, many of whom you have blessed with this incredible caramel flavor that we call sanguine. I pray, O oh God, that, Lord, you would affirm every gifting that you have placed inside of them. Father, there is no temperament that you have made, O oh God, that is faulty or broken in any way. In fact, when you created, you said, it is good. So I pray for every single one of them that, Lord, they would find joy, they would find affirmation in this message, and that, Lord, you would, you, you would teach them how to use the gifts they have for the sake of the kingdom. But I realize that there may be those who are listening and saying, oh, man, Maybe I've hurt some people. Maybe I've disappointed some people because of a lack of follow-through, a lack of commitment to a lack of discipline. And they come and they say, Father, forgive. Maybe even as they are listening, they can think of particular instances. People in their lives, maybe they have let down that they had committed to, but never came through. Father, I pray, O oh God, that Lord, for each who listens to the sound of my voice, the Lord, today, there would be forgiveness in your house. I pray, O oh God, that you'd enable them, O oh God, to experience the forgiveness of God, to forgive themselves, O oh God, and to begin to walk a new journey with others. But there are those also who are sitting and listening and saying, oh, I hear you, but I've been hurt by someone. There's someone who has let me down. There's someone who had committed, who had said they would. Someone who's a great person with great intentions, but they never came through. And it's left me hurt and bitter and disappointed. Father, you know that person. Even as they listen today, you know them. But thank God that just like Peter, you gave a second, a third chance, oh God, you're willing to give your people another chance. So Father, I pray for a release of forgiveness in this place today. I pray, oh God, as we listen today, the Lord, we would let go of those chains and those shackles of unforgiveness that bind us, oh Lord. But Father, I also want to pray for any who are saying, Lord, teach me discipline by the power of the Holy Spirit. Teach me discipline. Teach me commitment. And I pray for anyone who would open up their hands today and who would say to themselves, Lord, this is my earnest prayer as I come before you. I pray the Lord you would hear their prayer and allow them, O oh God, to walk anew. I pray the Lord you would fill them with the fruit of the Spirit. I pray that you would fill them, O oh God, with self-control. I pray the Lord you would fill them with discipline. And the Lord you would show them how it is that you are calling them to walk. We bless your name, Lord, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say. All God's people say. Amen. Hey, next week we're going to be unraveling our box of chocolates a bit more and looking at yet another one. Until then... God bless you and see you next time.